You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I talk with DJ, entrepreneur, and real estate investor Brian Orr about his past successes and failures in business and how that led him to real estate investing. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Brian Orr. Welcome to the show, Brian. Hey, Robert. How you doing, bud? Let's start with your journey into real estate. How'd you go from being a DJ to a real estate investor? Why'd you pick real estate? So yeah, it wasn't as much of a direct line. And it's not even that I necessarily went from one to the other because I actually still am DJing actively. But yeah, I've been DJing for a very long time now. I mean, I'll date myself for your audience. I started in the mid 90s. So I've been DJing for quite a long time. In those years, I've had various jobs, careers, simultaneous to my DJing career. I was a securities broker in in the city before the crash. I was doing project management on furniture and carpentry installations, a bunch of different things. How I discovered real estate was I was actually living in Vegas and my I started dating a girl in Charlotte who's now my wife and I was staying at my mother's house when I would be back in Charlotte who my mother lives in Charlotte and I currently live in Charlotte. So I was staying there and basically my mom was like an HGTV addict. And I literally just just in hanging out with my mom and the weekends that I would come visit Melissa, started getting into these flip shows. And I was like, this sounds sounds pretty cool. Like maybe I'll maybe I'll try one. And I did. And from that, I've just been hooked. So what are you working on today? So right now, from a real estate perspective, I founded a company called Keaton Capital just about four months ago. I'm still really, really early in the multifamily investing. I did single family for about four years. I bought a fourplex last year, November of 18. And in November of 19, I bought a 10plex. And I'm repositioning that currently. We're in, I've just had it about two months. And I'm shopping right now for bigger deals, just trying to really scale that multifamily portfolio. So what exactly are you doing with the properties? What strategies are you implementing? Are they just buy and hold? Are you doing some renovations? What does that look like? The first deal that I did was a single family. It was meant to be a flip. I bought it cash. It was, you know, I was driving around with my broker just learning about real estate. And this one just happened to pop up on MLS and we were a block away. And I was like, let's go. We went over there. We checked it out. It was completely gutted. Uh, not, not so much the infrastructure, but all the wiring was gone. The HVAC was gone. Everything. It, it ended up being a VA foreclosure. So they took highest and best and we put in a cash offer that day. And within 24 hours, I had that property. So I learned on the job on that one. It was determined to be a flip, but that didn't quite work out. We couldn't get the sale price that we wanted. So we ended up renting it, holding it for three years. We did the refinance strategy, sold it about three years later and made 25000 more than we would have on the flip. And most of that is from market timing. It's funny because until I got into multifamily, all my single family, I went in with one intention and, and ended up executing a completely different or exiting in a completely different way than I intended. As far as the multifamily goes, yeah, it's it's I'm buying like C class, B minus, value add type properties. My fourplex, I went in and didn't do too much, but the rents were way low. Got it at a pretty good deal and just did some minor, minor cosmetic reno. And then there was some issues with the septic that I fixed, but nobody outside of us really knew that that happened. You know, we got the rents up on that one and you know, I can tell you the numbers if you wanted to. And on the 10 unit. Yeah, just another distressed property. An owner just wanted to exit. He's had it just about five years. My guess is his balloon was coming up. I don't know, but he needed to get out of it. And he hadn't raised the rent in a while. It was mismanaged. It had a lot of capex, just deferred maintenance. But we got it, you know, at a really good deal. And, you know, the rent, the first unit that we turned in the last two months, the rent was five fifty and we rented it at seven or seven fifty. But massive increase with very, very little work in that one. There's a lot more work to come on that, on that unit. And so where are you doing all this? This is in North Carolina. So it is all local to where you live? Yeah, for now. And I live in Charlotte, but the properties are in... The, the single family portfolio was just outside of Charlotte. And the fourplex and the tenplex 
are much wider. They're a little bit more rural. And so let's dive into that first flip that turned rental. What happened with that? Why weren't you able to flip it? You mentioned you couldn't get the sale price, but where did the hiccup or where did the issue present itself? Was it in the calculations or did the market soften a little bit? What happened? Yeah. So the exact numbers on that, we bought it for like 42,000 cash. We put about 40,000 in rental. So we're in 82,000 or something and we priced it at 115. We were put it on the market and just weren't getting bites. Just weren't getting bites at 115. And we just weren't getting bites at all. I don't know. It was just a weird of the listing. I don't know what it was. But it turned out that uh, we said, well, let's just throw it on the rental market and see what we can get for rent. Now, we were only in 80,000. Good news is we went and got it appraised and the bank appraised it at, at 115. That's where we really came up with our list price from the bank appraisal. So when we couldn't get a, a buyer, we were like, well, what if we maybe we can just refinance? Like, I didn't know anything about real estate. Like, I didn't know anything about the finances for real estate until I started doing it. Then I discovered like the refi. And the idea that we basically kept all of our equity in the property and removed all the equity that we put into the property. So we cashed back out the full 85,000. Our mortgage was 400 and something dollars and we're renting it at 925. So we're making $500 a month on this property. I was like, well, that's not a bad deal. Like, let's just go ahead and do that. Like, let's just keep doing that more and more. I didn't know that that was like a thing, but I thought it was a pretty good strategy. I was like, I should, they don't teach you that on HGTV, but I was like, let me, uh, let me try to, Try to do that. So we just held on to it. And like two or three years later, the market was just appreciating and we ended up selling it for 139. And so, how many single family properties did you purchase before you made the transition to the multifamily space? It was four. So, the reason why is because when I was here with Melissa, I moved back to North Carolina from Vegas. And that's when I ended up doing this deal. And we were only here for about a year or so before we decided. That we were going to move back to New York. So we were in New York for about two years, a little more than two years, came back down. And my first purchase when we came back down was the fourplex. So for about two years in that window, I didn't, I didn't invest in anything. And so what made you want to make that transition from the single family? It sounds like you're having some success there. So why did you want to go from single family to multifamily? Yeah. So we had a good bit of success. I'll tell you about this wholesale deal that I didn't know. I didn't know what wholesaling was. It ended up being like a double close, but I'll get into that in a minute. Really, it was just education. So once I did those first three or four deals, I started, well, not at the end of that, but in the process of that, I started really diving deep into real estate education. I was like, there's so much about this that I don't know. Let me just learn and learn and learn. So that's what I did. I just really sought out education in every form, books and and podcasts and I took courses. I took like like the Udemy courses, and I actually took a graduate certificate course at Cornell in commercial real estate. I just really dove all the way in, and the more that I researched, the more that economies of scale just made sense. And I was like, wow, if I can do this with one roof, you know, if I can have four units under one roof, or if I can have ten or twenty or a hundred, that seems like a much more logical way to go. And then it just became about finding the path to execute that strategy. And so what have you found to be the major differences operationally and tactically between not only purchasing single family, but also purchasing, renovating, and filling single family compared to those multifamily properties? As far as purchasing the single family, I mean, we'll go back to my first flip on Hoover Street. It was all eggs in one basket. I mean, it was just all or nothing. And we sort of executed that strategy. I wouldn't say necessarily out of panic, but sort of out of necessity. It just became something that we didn't plan for it to be. There's definitely a different model when you're dealing with multifamily. But I think for me personally, it's really mostly about knowing, having, being better prepared going into the deal, knowing exactly what I want to do with the deal and how I'm going to get out of the deal. And that's from experience and education, I think. If you're looking for like a direct answer, you know, filling the the multifamily, for example, I bought this one. It had it had the ten unit. It had nine tenants in there already. I was cash flowing before. You know, the vacancy was no sweat off my back. I mean, yeah, it's great to have more cash flow, but I was cash flowing without that tenant. I was able to take my time, plan out the strategy for the value add, execute it, and get the tenant in with the you know much larger rent increase. And now I have that model built out for the other nine when they become vacant. I'm actually working on one right now that should be ready for February 1st, and then five more coming up for March 1st. So it is a very 
I feel like it's less stressful. It's less stressful because your risk is just spread across so many other different people as opposed to just like that all eggs in one basket. Now that you've done both single family and multifamily, if you could go back and do it again, do you think you would jump straight into multifamily? And the reason I ask that is because there's a lot of new investors listening to the show today. And I think a lot of them wonder, should I start in single family? Should I go right to multifamily? And so for someone that's thinking that to themselves, would you recommend that they go into multifamily directly or should they get their feet wet and maybe start with a single family before? From my experience, I don't think single family necessarily prepares you for multifamily. It really is two different animals. What single family did was force me to get my education in real estate. And I think that just being prepared for whatever asset class you're going to go into, you just be prepared. And preparation also, you know, there's no substitute for experience. So I think if your entry point, listen, if I could do it again, if I, if I knew then what I know now, yeah, I would go straight into multifamily. And if I had the opportunity right now, I wouldn't even buy a 35 unit that I'm looking at. I would just go right to 150. I just don't have the, the scale right now, the opportunity to get the 150, which I'm working towards. I'll have it probably by the end of the year. But oh man, that's a tough question. Because like, I only know what I know because of what I did through single family and the way that it forced me to learn and the issues that I had with contractors and licenses and permits and all this stuff that I learned on the job. So I I would never want to tell somebody where to start, but I definitely be prepared and get as much education and experience as you can. For me personally, I like starting with single family as your first property. And I kind of laughed to myself when I say that because I always thought when I first got started in real estate, I always told myself, I'll never do a single family. I always heard everybody that has been successful in real estate saying, go big, go big, go big. And so I always told myself, I'll never buy single family. And then I wasn't able to find any good deals in the multifamily space. And so I wasn't, I wasn't taking any action. So I decided to buy a single family for my first rental. And I'm so glad that I did that because I learned so many things and it's on such a smaller scale. If you go in and you buy a multifamily where you have four, five, six units and you don't know what you're doing, now you don't know what you're doing for six different units. Or if it's single family, everything goes as bad as it can. It's only one unit, one family, one situation that you need to fix versus six. And so I personally like the single family to start, but I mean, I think there's value in going right to multifamily as well. Yeah. Isn't it wild? There's just so many different schools of thought. Yeah. I mean, I preface it with if you have the education and you can't get the education without that experience, you know? So, like, yeah, I mean, if I had to give you a, an answer, I would say start with a smaller deal. How about that? Start with a smaller deal with less risk and where you can learn and make mistakes without putting too many people, impacting too many people negatively if you screw it up. Then go from there. Yeah, I think a small deal is a good way to to phrase it because it doesn't necessarily have to be single family, but maybe a duplex, triplex, maybe even a fourplex. So that's still not massive. And that's probably better than going right into a 10, 15, 20 plus unit deals. And I thought I was well-educated before I got into it. You know, I'd read a lot of books, podcasts. I thought I had studied a lot, but that's all theory. And it's so different when you mm-hmm. actually get into practice. Real life is so different than what you read in the books. And so you really need to do your first deal to make sure you understand it. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And you know something else we we didn't touch on like yeah we're talking in this um bubble of this ideal world like if you're starting today where would you start but there's so many other things to consider with just are you able to find that deal like like you mentioned you had trouble finding a multifamily so what's your network look like what's your net worth look like do you have access to capital to buy a bigger deal is anybody else have trust and confidence in you to execute a bigger deal are you going to be able to get investors if you want to go that route is the bank going to lend you on a $2 million property or whatever it is that you're shooting for multifamily? So while you may want to start there, if you're actually able to get there is a whole different story. And this whole dynamic between theoretical and what you actually put into practice reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Mike Tyson, where he says, everybody has a plan to get punched in the mouth. So you get punched in the mouth. Right. So if yep. I mean, <laughs> you think you know everything you're going into the deal with, and then you get punched in the mouth and something comes up that you didn't read in the book or hear somewhere else and now you got to figure it out. So it's definitely definitely uh, an interesting dynamic to think about when you're just starting out. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing too, like action is first and foremost. You have to take action, right? You have to be doing something. You have to get in that first deal whatever it is. You know, you're only going to learn like I'm never going to know what a 50 unit deal is like until I do a 50 unit Never going to know what a 200 unit deal is like until I do a 200 unit deal. No matter how many single families I did, I'm still going to learn what a 200 unit is when I buy my first 200 unit. So you're never going to be endlessly prepared unless you go backwards. And I, I certainly wouldn't recommend doing that. 
Yeah, I like to get into things and I like to recommend people get into things with as little risk as possible. And so on my first deal, the mortgage was like $300. So I said, worst case scenario, I can't rent this. Everything goes sideways. I can cover $300 a month. So I like to recommend something like that to get started because you don't want somebody to not only get put in a hole, but you also don't want them to get spooked. You know, no matter what, and I believe that no matter what, your first deal is not going to be a home run that makes you wealthy and able to retire. I think it's better to just get started get excited about real estate, not get screwed over by your first deal and not be interested in real estate anymore. So when we talk about the different ways that new investors are getting started or should get started, what do you think the biggest thing is that holds them back from actually getting started? The biggest thing that holds people back from getting started? I mean, the easy answer is lack of action, right? Because if you don't act, you're never going to get started. So, so that's kind of the default answer. But what actually holds people back, I think, is fear, having fear, lack of resources, lack of network, people around you who can instill that confidence in you, that have experience that can share with you. It's, it's always better to learn from someone else's mistakes than necessarily having to go through it on your own. So I think what holds people back is just either not having, just not having the opportunity to, to do a deal, being afraid or thinking that like, if you do a real estate deal, that's it. Like now you all of a sudden you're a real estate investor and you you just can't go back to your job ever again over committing, that sort of thing. Well, I can't invest in real estate because I have a job. Well, that doesn't really make sense to me, but that's one of the fears that people have. They think it's like a full-on career change. So I would say those might be a few different things I think that hold people back. It certainly can be a career change, but it doesn't have to be. I personally work a full-time job. I have a full career and then I invest in real estate on the side. I like my corporate job. I enjoy what I do. So I don't have a need to leave and I compensated well. So I do real estate on the side to build my passive income. And then I do my full-time job at the same time. So it's definitely not mutually exclusive. You can do both things. But I think that's a good point. That's a fear that a lot of, I think a lot of people have, but not a lot of people talk about. So I think that was good to bring up. How can people just overcome general fear of getting into real estate? Not necessarily about it taking over your job, but just real estate in general. Because I, I agree that I think that is a big thing that holds people back. How can they overcome that? I've come across that a few different times with people, whether it be at meetings or, or potential investors. First thing I would say is just because you invest in real estate doesn't mean, like you said, you know, it doesn't just catapult you to this other level of whatever. You're not changing your whole career just because you're investing in real estate. It's just a different asset. You're in your 401k. That doesn't make you a securities broker. You can invest in real estate without leaving your nine to five. You shouldn't leave your nine to five. I wouldn't recommend whether you're making 20,000 or 200,000. There has to be a very long road between the time that you buy your first property and decide that you're not going to work anymore and you're just going to do that for a living. And a lot of things have to go your way and fall into place in order for that to be your path. I would say the only way to ever overcome fear, I think, is attacking it head on, but being prepared for it being prepared, like afraid of parachuting, for example, jumping out of a plane. I don't know that I would ever do it, right? But I certainly know that if I ever did do it, I would make sure that I was with somebody who knew what they were doing and that I like had a parachute. There are certain fundamentals that you want to make sure you're prepared to take on any fear that you have. So take it on. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear be something that holds you back, but be prepared to take on the fear. Don't just go in blind. Just because you're fearful doesn't mean you can't do it. I think the best way to really overcome that fear is get educated, understand what you're doing, and then just do it. And do it with yeah. as little risk as you can. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to partner. Don't be afraid to look for a mentor. Don't be afraid to try to find people who have done it before you. Especially what I've found in this world, in most cases, but especially in this world, people who have done deals want to tell you about their deals. People who have messed up want to tell you about the way they messed up and the way that they've succeeded. There's a wealth of information and there's people in your hometown or on the web or on a podcast or whatever that will, that will probably come uh, shop your deal or, or do a walkthrough, probably help you underwrite. Surround yourself with people who can support you in taking the leap and then just go for it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned mistakes. Let's talk about those. What have been some of the mistakes that you've made both in real estate and in business that new real estate investors can learn from? Here's where I've failed. I've failed a bunch of different times. Most of my failures, and this has only sort of been... The light has, has shined down on this since I just recently started blogging and I started actually talking about it. My failures come when 
I invest in something, something that I don't know and something that I don't have control over. So in securities market, I was a broker for a few years in New York. But when I thought that I could take on the stock market by myself and do my own trading for myself, and I failed. I mean, my, my brokerage account, it's nothing to, be, to talk about. I've invested in different businesses. I've invested in hospitality businesses. I invested in things that I don't know about and I've failed. So mistakes for one, I feel like I keep falling back to the same answer, but not being educated. If you're talking about actual mistakes, man, make sure that your contractors are licensed. Make sure that you're, you have a solid team in place, which I didn't have in the beginning, a real estate specific attorney, a real estate specific accountant. Make sure you have a lender that is on your side. Small banks, I would go to bat for small banks any day of the week. I've had so much more success with local banks than I did with the big banks. It just keeps coming back to that same thing, like learning, 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 studying, and putting it into practice. But man, there's a lot of mistakes. So how have those mistakes... I know you have written about your mistakes that you made in the stock market as well as a restaurant venture you had in Spain. So how have all of these mistakes that you've made impacted how you invest in real estate? So it really did just come down to finding a vehicle where I felt I had more control over the performance. And with securities, you definitely don't have that. You have none. You know, your competition, I mean, you're competing against guys that trade in, in milliseconds and who do it 20 hours a day. The restaurant, we had a bunch of different issues with the government in Spain, with local ordinances, different things that impacted us that we didn't have control over. Now, in real estate, you don't have control over everything, but you do have a lot of control. And with, I guess, just making those mistakes are in a, in a fail forward kind of mentality, like learn from the mistakes and don't just let them be mistakes. Absorb the mistake, take the lesson from the mistake, and make sure that you don't repeat that mistake or one like it going forward. For example, the, the legal stuff in Spain, before I started doing multifamily, I spent hours and hours and hours with multiple different attorneys in and around the Charlotte area to make sure that you know I had all my checks and balances in place, which I didn't do when I invested overseas in Spain. So I learned you know, that's a direct lesson that I learned from that, that I will never make that mistake again. You're a very busy guy. You must be because you have multiple businesses and a family. So how can someone listening to the show who's working a full-time job, want to invest in real estate, manage their time to be successful in both their work and their career and investing? I can tell you what I did. Get up early, earlier than normal, right? I have two kids. I get up before them so I can get some work done. If you're working a nine to five, like I, you know, like I said earlier, don't stress your nine to five. Look, if you're doing whatever your job is, if you're a doctor or if you're working at McDonald's, first things first, you have to save and you have to be smart with your money. I mean, financial literacy is above all else, just to have the opportunity to invest. But let's say you've put yourself in the position where you can invest. You know, you have to look at it and say, well, how many hours is it going to take me to actually flip a house? And you're not going to know it. You're not going to know it until you get into it. But talk to as many people as you can. Build out a map of the business. Like, Okay, I'm getting ready to flip a house. Is it going to be 10 hours a week? Am I doing this work myself? Am I outsourcing these contractors? Who's going to be there to make sure that the appliances are delivered and or the flooring or whatever? My best piece of advice for that would be get up early and work hard. Stay up late and work hard. But don't dive off the cliff and think that you're going to spend all your time like learning and executing real estate deals and then sacrifice your family or sacrifice your career that's actually paying you. Because the real estate is not going to pay you for quite some time, even if you have a successful first deal. When you really calculate the hours that went into it, you probably didn't do that well. And it's not going to pay itself off for a long time. So my best piece of advice would be educate, educate, and then find people who are already doing it. Get in on their deals where you don't have such an active role. And maybe financially, maybe it's just a couple hours that you can volunteer on the weekends or at night and see if you can help someone in whatever your skill set is and apply that to their deal. And might not benefit you tremendously financially right off the bat, but it's going to really help you build your internal portfolio, the things that you need, your skill set, and your experience. Certainly don't alienate your nine to five and certainly don't alienate your family. Why do you think a new investor should consider real estate as the asset class to go into? One, the opportunities to learn are abundant. 
like I mentioned with meetups and with podcasts, there's just so much opportunity to learn. There's a lot of opportunity to enter. There's so many different ways that you can get into real estate. I, there's none that I can't speak on things like notes or necessarily wholesaling, although one deal is kind of weird. But there's so many different ways to enter into real estate and you can invest in real estate. Not everything investing in real estate is I personally buy a five unit or a 10 unit apartment building and then I personally flip it and I personally get tenants and then I personally manage those tenants and I personally fix those toilets. Like that's not the way it works. But when you have ownership and you have you have control. And I just feel like real estate is really that vehicle where you can do so much, you can leverage. When I was buying stocks, right? I'm buying stocks. If I have $10 and I buy $10 worth of Coca-Cola stock, I get $10 worth of Coca-Cola stock. If I take that $10 to a bank and say, hey, can I use this $10 and then you give me the other $90 and we can buy a $100 house together, right? Bank's going to lend you, assuming the deal makes sense, the bank's going to lend you that $90 to buy that $100 property. Well, obviously not 100, right? 100,000 or whatever. So with $10,000, let's say, let's just scale it to something reasonable. With $10,000, you only get $10,000 worth of stock. $10,000, you can get $100,000 worth of real estate that you have control over. I mean, it really is just an amazing, amazing vehicle. And then, of course, you talk about the tax benefits and you talk about the opportunity to scale if you, you do bigger deals with outside investors. It's just such a tremendous, tremendous vehicle. And what has been your best deal to date? Probably that wholesale ish type deal. It wasn't a wholesale. I only use that term because it makes the most sense for what it was. We came across this deal. It was right after I finished the flip at Hoover Street, that first flip that we didn't sell. So it's right after that. We came across this deal. It ended up being like a probate sale that we got at $72,000. I went in, I estimated it. I had a few contractors come out and estimate it. We were looking at spending $30,000. And I knew because we had just tested the market with the other one that it was a very similar house and the renovations that we were going to do, we'd probably stand to sell it around 130 or so. so. We're looking at buying it at 70-ish, putting 30 in and getting 30 out. And I know how much work it was to go into that flip, the issues that I had with the contractors. I spent time in court because they weren't licensed and they didn't get permits and that whole other thing. So I'm sitting there going, is this the type of investment that I want to make right now? Do I want to hire another contractor? Do I want to spend 30 more to make 30? So we closed on the property. That day, we go home and I say we as my mother's business partner. So we closed on the property. That day, we go back to the house and I said, we can make 30,000 on this after three months of flipping headache because flipping is a headache. And I was like, what if we just list it? Let me just list it. I'm not going to convert the den into a third bedroom. I'm not going to take out the old 1970s cabinets. I'm not going to do whatever to the screen porch and all this other stuff that we're going to do. What if we just list it at 105? Let's just list it for 30 grand more than we bought it for. And if we make 20,000, let's say we sell it at 95, we make 20,000, we've made 20,000 in three hours. Like I can deal with that instead of 30,000 over three months, right? So we listed it. That day, we had an agent call us and said, we had a teacher just come in. She just moved to the area. She went and looked at the house. She absolutely loves the wood paneling in that den that we were going to convert to a bedroom. She loves... It's the perfect size for her. She loves the den. She loves the, the vintage kitchen. She loved everything about it. And we had a full price offer that day. And we closed in 30 days for $30,000 more than we bought it for. So I would probably chalk that one up as the best deal. Yeah, I would probably say that that's a hard deal to beat. So it wasn't like technically a wholesale. Anybody who knows real estate knows that that's not a wholesale deal. But essentially what it means is we did take control of the property, but then we listed it again right away. So I didn't, ever, I didn't actually end up doing anything to the property. It's easiest explanation. I just call it a wholesale. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's not, like you said, it's not quite a wholesale, but it makes sense in that context too. And not only was it quick, but now you didn't have any risk in terms of the renovation because you said you would make 30000 after three months of renovating, but that's if mm -hmm. everything went the way it was supposed to, right? That's if everything was perfect. Not if you ran into any issues or anything like that, and that could knock down that margin even more. So in reality, not only did you get the same amount, but also you saved yourself the headache, the time, and the risk. Right. Like it took us work to get to that point, to get that deal under contract and go through it. Right. So 
But all of that was sunk already. That was all already gone. That's what factored in in the beginning. So now it really are. I'm looking at three months work, however many hours, because flipping, guys, if you haven't flipped yet, it's not what it is on TV, man. It's hours and hours and hours. And even if you have a contractor, I mean, if you're if you can afford the 20% markup on the, on their work, you know, you probably you're gonna feel that in the end. So be careful hiring out a contractor at a 20% markup. So you being on site, whatever it is, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Having just gone through that and just imagining how many hours it would take, whatever the math is, $30,000 profit by three months work. Instead, we made $30,000 in three hours. So you know, $10,000 an hour is a pretty good deal. And I'll tell you what, going back to the question before, there's, there's not really too many other asset classes that you're going to be able to execute a deal like that. And so are you doing anything to try and find more deals like this? I did for a little bit. The only problem is, is that that was, exists primarily in the single family space from the probate standpoint. I mean, it's rare, at least in my experience, that you're going to find that in a larger asset. So I did for a little while. And what I did there was I was, I was courting lawyers and you know, showing up, bringing donuts and all of that sort of stuff. Like, hey, you guys, uh, anybody die lately? That sort of thing. See if, that, see if that existed. Since I shifted, that's not really a strategy for me anymore. But it's a great strategy for people who are looking to do single families. It's also worth mentioning that now that you're working on a different strategy, you're focused on that strategy specifically. You're not trying to do all kinds of different things. You're not trying to do three different strategies at once. And you're really going all in and focusing in on the strategy that you're working on, which I think is important because if you start to spread out too much, you lose your expertise, you lose your edge where you can actually really compete and drive successful results. I completely agree with that. Narrow your focus. Early on, we're talking about people who are just getting into it. You don't know what you're, what you're going to land on. So listen, if you flip a house and then you decide to try to do some wholesale deals, I understand testing the market a little bit, see what it's like, see what you like, see what you're able to actually execute and how you're able to turn a profit. But once you land on something, just become the master of that, I think. Become the master of that. And then once I have 200, 300, 500, 1,000 units, if a couple of single families pop up, if the market adjusts and there's a way that I can do a quick turn because I have a contractor now, it's in an accessible area. I know that there's a foreclosure market skyrocket again, something like that. I wouldn't say that I would never do a single family again, but it would have to be an ideal type scenario. So I would completely agree with that. Like Find whatever your niche is, whatever you're going to be best at, and just become a master of it. And that's not to say you can't do multiple things, but it's having a primary focus, right? I talked to a lot of successful rental property investors. They actually do some flips on the side, but that's not their primary thing. They're focused solely on real estate rentals. They do some flipping from time to time. They're focused on one or the other and then using the other to kind of supplement. And a lot of them use flips to fund their rental properties. Right. And when you say rental properties, are they doing single families? Mostly multi. Mostly multi too, and then they're flipping for the quicker cash. Exactly, or yeah. even commercial. I had we had Mark Ferguson on the show recently. He's doing a lot of flips, but he's also he's using all of that cash to fund his commercial deals. So you know what I would say to that is when you're talking about how to find deals, right? Finding multifamily deals is very different than finding single family deals, and I think the focus in that sense would be more like like with the single family. You find a deal that's a good deal. Well, then you find what way to make that deal work. So that might be a flip. It might be a buy and hold, a smaller renovation and a long-term hold because it's going to cash flow. So I can totally see doing that where you enter it this, and then you might be doing flipping some properties and might be buy and hold some properties. For me personally right now, I couldn't imagine going into a flip again. Now, listen, this 10 unit I bought two months ago, let's say I'm able to reposition this thing in six months and I have all new tenants in and all the rents are raised $200 and my NOI is through the roof and now the property value is through the roof. And somebody comes in and says, Hey, I'll buy this for 300 grand more than you paid for it. Technically, that's a flip, right? So I wouldn't say, No, I'm not flipping. If it makes sense at that stage and, and I could turn that profit, I'm not against it. Yeah, absolutely. You can be an opportunistic investor. You just need to make sure that you're spending most of your time focusing on one thing. If a great deal comes up in a different strategy, you can attack it if it fits within your bandwidth. It's just really where you focus. But Brian, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Where can the audience go to learn more about you and just all the different things that you have going on? My website is thetwistlife.com. Actually, I'm launching a podcast myself about my life as told through the story of my guests on the podcast. And 
my DJ career, Keaton Capital, the investment company. You can just find everything on the twistlife.com. I'll be sure to put links to various different things that we talked about throughout the show, as well as some books that relate to the different material we've talked about in the show notes, as well as all of Brian's resources so that you can go connect with him there. Brian, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. I appreciate it. This is great. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.